The April issue of Popular Mechanics from 1994 states that the Presario 425 isn't likely to become obsolete anytime soon. That's a pretty hilarious statement in hindsight, as computers evolved incredibly fast at the time. But as I think we will find out in this video, maybe there was some truth to that statement. This is the Compact Presario 433 from 1994. From what I could find online, it's identical to the more common 425, aside from having a slightly faster 486. In this video we are going to restore it and see how fast we can make it. I've had this compact for ages, but I have actually never used it. In fact, I have never even turned it on, or had a look inside. So let's start with a smoke test and see what we're up against. Ok, power connected, but not turned on. So fingers crossed. Ok, no burning reefer, that's a good start. Let's turn it on. And I can hear the fan spinning, and the hard drive, and it's posting. And we've got 12 megs of RAM. And we've got an error, 162, system option not set. Let's try F10. Compact Computer Corporation. And the CMOS battery has clearly gone bad. And we've got an interesting message here. The following configuration options were automatically updated. And the interesting bit here is the Mathco. As far as I know, these had SX CPUs. So maybe we're lucky. Maybe there is an upgrade in this machine. Let's continue and have a look here. And we seem to have a 212 meg hard drive. But it doesn't say anything about the 486. Oh, and here it actually says numeric coprocessor not installed. So probably no such luck. Let's see if it boots. And we've got missing operating system. So either the hard drive is broken or just erased. Ok, let's take it apart, get that nasty case cleaned up and see if we can fix it before we do some upgrades. And back here we have two screws. And the cool thing about this machine is that it's about the same size of a regular CRT display. But it's a complete 486 system. And now I think we can just pull the entire system out. And this is pretty cool. But first, I'd like to thank PCBWay for supporting today's video. Aside from making excellent PCBs, like the socket blaster in this video, they also do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection molding. Perfect for vintage computer shenanigans like this. Get an instant quote now at PCBWay.com. And in here we have an SX in a socket. So not soldered to the board as I thought. And a very strange looking connector here that I have never seen before. It reminds me of a SCSI connector. How odd. I wonder what that is. And I noticed something really odd. There are tons and tons of unpopulated pads. So what's that all about? This entire corner here has pads for various chips, but no chips. How odd. And back here it has a big nasty crack. And by the way, this is the actual compact branded screwdriver I used back in the day when I was working on compacts. But at that time this machine was already obsolete, so I can't recall ever working on one of these. And the reason why I have never used this machine is because it's absolutely disgusting. It's completely covered in some yellow nasty gunk. But it doesn't smell bad, so I don't have any clues to what it might be. So I don't know how to take these apart. So I'm gonna guess here and start by... See if I can remove this cage. And towards the front of the case here... We have a connector that connects the display to the motherboard. And after removing these screws here, the front panel kind of feels loose. So let's see if the front piece comes off. So normally the back piece comes off first. But maybe this machine is different. Yeah, it feels kind of loose, but I think the tube is connected to this piece here. Like on a normal CRT display. So let's give this a try. 
And yes, it came right off. And it has that yellow nasty gunk on the inside too. So I'm gonna have to do a lot of cleaning off camera. Okay, let's see what we've got. A lot of nasty dust. And a pretty normal amount of soot. So I would say this tube has seen some normal use. And this board has an incredible amount of adjustment pots. So this entire row here, and there are a few more up here. And I can see even more on this board here. So that's a first for sure. And how's that for odd screws? Never seen that before. So I'm not gonna bore you with it in the video, but here in real life, there's going to be a lot of cleaning. Really odd screws and mounting brackets for the tube. And next, I think we should remove this cage here that surrounds the motherboard. Yes, I think it's loose. Well, sort of. The cage is loose, but there are a bunch of cables that are stuck to this piece on the other side of the cage. So let's pop these off and try again. And apparently the lower front piece came off. So if I'm not mistaken, this piece here is probably shared with the CRT display of the time. And just look at how disgusting this thing is. And we have what looks like a regular VGA cable stuck to this piece here. And one of the leads is unfortunately soldered to this shield here, so I can't just disconnect it. I guess we could just desolder it. However, I think it's easier to remove this piece here. Because it's gonna have to come off anyways. It's hard to tell because the case is so filthy. But I think it needs some Retrobrite. And apparently this was just a nut that used to be glued to the PCB. So let's put it back on. So I won't forget to put it back on later. And now we can remove the front piece. Uh, not sure if the camera picks it up. But this case is just absolutely disgusting. Now let's see if we can remove this shield here. With the PCB that's stuck on its side. And this seems to be the power supply. And if you're playing along here, take pictures of every connector when you take something like this apart. Because it will make the reassembly way quicker. And next we have a small PCB with adjustment pots for the front panel. And hopefully it will now come off, and it does. And there are tons of cable ties. So let's see if we can remove the neck board next. So that's interesting. The neck board seems to be held in place by the zip tie here. Never seen one of these before. So let's cut that zip tie off. And hopefully we can replace it with a standard zip tie. And now let's see if this neck board comes off. And it does. So now I think we can take this shield here off with the other PCB. Okay, two more screws, and I think we can take that tube out. And a big difference compared to the older stuff is that a display like this has so much more stuff in it. And everything is just bigger and thicker. And the tube, by the way, is from Toshiba. And it's out. Okay, and the case is out sunbathing. And while we wait, let's take the rest of the machine apart. And I think we're missing a couple of screws here. And I think we're missing a couple of screws on this side too. So the razor board should probably be screwed in place. So I think someone has been inside here and messed with the hard drive. Because this screw here is missing too. So that means the hard drive is already loose. And it is. Ha. Huh. And it's an ST3250A with compact numbers, so this is probably the original drive. And it's 213 megs. And the diskette drive has compact numbers too. So that's probably the original drive. Luckily I have collected these original compact screws over the years. So we've got replacements to make it as original as possible. And I think I have a decent guess to what these empty pads might be. 
because the article that I read in the beginning of the video states that these machines had built-in modems and this machine doesn't so at least some of these pads here are probably for a modem and since the power supply is built in in the display we've got this odd thing here to supply power to the hard drive and the diskette drive and now I think we only have this screw here and then we should be able to take the motherboard out and not quite, we still have these connectors here for the power LED and the speaker and one more screw here so the Compaq 425 has an SX25 soldered to the board to these pads here so I was expecting to find something similar here obviously being a slightly faster 486 and we need to take everything apart because everything needs to be cleaned up okay so the good bit so far is that we don't have any corrosion at all and no leaky batteries and I'm gonna think twice before I start a filthy project like this again there's been a lot of cleaning already off camera and I'm gonna have to do quite a bit more and that yellow gunk on the case actually came off quite easily so I think perhaps someone sprayed it with some detergent and then ended up not really cleaning it off I guess that would explain why it looks so filthy but doesn't smell bad and the power supply doesn't have refus so that's a bonus and I did a first inspection and I don't see any leaky caps so I'm just gonna move on and clean all the boards and by the way I have never seen so many adjustment pots in a CRT display before there are adjustment pots all over this display this board alone here has 18 of them and I think this should be enough for me to be able to clean everything so I'll do some cleaning off camera and I'll see you on the other side 24 hours later okay so this compact has clearly been dropped but the only significant damage seems to be this large crack and I managed to push it back so it looks at least all right and then I added some super glue and baking soda and this creates an incredibly strong bond so this is going to hold up really well and as you can see it looks way better it's not perfect but it's way better than it was before and the case is back from Retrobright and I'm very happy with the result so cleaned up restored parts are piling up on the bench I think it's time for the reassembly Okay, before we can move on here we need to replace that dead battery and it's an odd one it's a BR2330 but let's see if we can replace it with a regular CR2032 and there is some old flux on the legs so maybe it has been replaced before or perhaps just hand soldered at the factory now let's see if it comes off and it does and we have some extra pads here so let's clear this through hole here and see if a regular coin cell holder will fit and it does so those pads are obviously meant for a holder like this one perfect and the only thing we need to do now is to solder these two legs and I did check the polarity so let's snip those legs off and clean that flux uh, now we can install regular CR2032 and since the board gets power through that weird connector I can't really do any tests without having the board inside the machine so swapping that CPU 
it's going to be a bit tricky. Um, before we start swapping that 486, I want to try out this hard drive and see what's going on. So we can run some benchmarks. And I found my bag with spare compact screws. And hopefully the hard drive hasn't been damaged while it was loose in the case. And I opened up the diskette drive off camera, cleaned it inside and also cleaned the heads. And aside from being dusty, it looked all right. So it probably works. Okay, I think that's enough reassembly to make a test. And as you can see, the case looks absolutely fantastic compared to what it did before. And Compaq, kindly enough, put the power connector like this. So this machine can sit flush towards the wall and take up less space. Nice touch. Okay, let's turn the power on and see if it still works. Well, the hard drive spins up and I can hear the fan. And I think we need to adjust the screen. That's much better. Now let's set the time and date and see if our battery works. And it looks to be a year 2000 compliant. Perfect. And the battery seems to be working. But that hard drive made a noise that makes me a bit worried. Let's try to boot to the skit. Okay, let's try F-Disk. Error reading fix disk. Ha! Huh. So, I think we have a dead drive, unfortunately. Let's try F-Disk MBR. Uh, try again. No, that didn't help. Okay, so unfortunately we have a dead drive, so I'm gonna look through my stash and pick something suitable. And luckily I picked up a dozen of these Connor drives on my visit to Computer Reset. Uh, that's a pretty good match for this machine. It's a Connor CFS2110A and it's a 210 meg drive, so almost the same size as the original drive. And it says OK, so I think I have tested this drive. By the way, all but one of those drives in that huge pile were actually working. Only one of the drives was bad. And it wasn't a Connor drive. And I don't remember if I have erased that drive. But all of those drives had DOS installed. And all sorts of software. Yeah, just like this one here. So let's see what's on here. So we've got DOS and a bunch of other stuff. Let's try this ODI boots. Perhaps that will give us a clue. And it went by too fast for me to see, but it tried to auto boot something, but was missing some files. And it looks to be some kind of network software. So it was probably complaining about missing a network card. Let's see what else we've got. Employee, company and practice. So definitely corporate use. So what's this QEXE? QEdit. And we get the option of buying it for 54 bucks. And I think I'm gonna pass. Okay, so nothing really interesting. So let's boot to DOS and make a clean install. I think I have found a copy of the original Restore Diskettes online. But unfortunately I'm running out of time here, so I'm gonna skip it for now. And maybe we'll have a look at it in a follow-up video. So let's just get some benchmarks running on this machine. And apparently it was running DOS 5. So let's clear that partition and create a new one. Okay, so I will install DOS and some benchmarks off camera here and then we will continue okay let's run some doom and see what this machine can do oh that is slow that is unplayable that is just way too slow to play oh i might as well go and grab a coffee this is taking forever okay and uh, we've got 5551 real takes that is slow 
That gives us 13.4 FPS. Okay, let's do some upgrades and see if we can make this machine run a bit faster. And underneath the machine there is actually a sticker that tells us how to set the jumpers. So this shouldn't be too hard. No hacking needed on this machine. And we're going to change it from the 486SX. So we basically need to change the position of all the jumpers. And it actually says clearly on the board too. So we don't really need that sticker. So let's get that 486SX out. And that's the tricky bit, without removing the board. But I think it's doable. By the way, if you like this type of content, let me know with a thumbs up. So luckily there is a large hole in the front of the case. I can get access with a screwdriver. Not ideal, but it works. Now let's see if there's room enough here for a 5x86 on the socket blaster. And there is, just about. And I'm gonna have to figure something out to keep that 5x86 cool. And I'm obviously not gonna keep it like this. But just for a quick test, I'm just gonna tape it down so it doesn't fall off and short something. And I'm gonna have to glue a heatsink to whatever it gets to stay in here. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's see what it does. Well, the hard drive spins up and it's counting up the RAM. And we've got an error, 702A. Mathco has been detected, uh, but not reported in CMOS. So let's report it. And uh, now it's asking us about the OS. That's weird. Unix or DOS? Huh. That's the first. And unfortunately the BIOS doesn't tell us what CPU it has. And something went wrong. So the system doesn't boot. Huh. In fact, it hanged completely. So let's turn the power off and try again. I haven't set the hard drive correctly in BIOS, so that could be the problem. And I think I guessed right, because now it's complaining about disk zero failure. So, let's see if we can fix it. Uh, luckily I have a few of these, so I didn't have to take it out to check. So let's see if we can find a match here. And uh, no, so I wonder if we can set that manually. Uh, we've got something here, custom drive definition. Oh, here we go. So it's a separate menu. Excellent, okay. Well, not sure what max ECC is, but I set the landing zone to the same as cylinders and write pre-comp to zero. Let's see if this works. Let's save and exit and see what happens. Now it boosts to DOS. Awesome. So that fixed the problem. So let's run Doom and see what happens. And it's still slow. So what's up with this? I didn't expect too much, but this is way slower than I expected. Huh, that's odd. Well, it is a bit faster, but way less than I expected. So we've got 3740 real ticks. Uh, that's 19.97 FPS. So is this the fastest this machine will go? Let's try something else for comparison. I guess perhaps the graphics is our issue here. And I think I forgot to mention, this board has a Cirrus Logic 5420 and it runs off the ISA bus. So that's why I didn't expect much. But I did expect more than this, to be honest. Let's see if we get the same speed with an ODP R100. Well, that's really weird. I think it runs slightly faster. What's up with this? What's going on here? Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is faster. Uh, we've got 3684 real ticks. And yeah, that is actually marginally faster. That's 20.27 FPS. So, what's going on here? This is a mystery to me. Let's try with another graphics card. So, let's get that Razer board in. And the fastest ISA card I have is this ET4000. It's a new old stock OEM card I found on eBay. So, it has a weird bracket. And it requires some persuasion to go in. 
in most machines. There we go. Okay, let's try this. Okay, so it disabled the onboard graphics and it's now running off this display here. Let's run Doom and see what happens. Well, no major difference, unfortunately. And we've got 3733 real takes. And that is actually slightly slower. That's 20.0 FPS. So the onboard ISA graphics are actually slightly faster. So I think we have reached the limit for what this machine can do. Okay, so let's add a sound card. And I'm gonna go with a CT1740. Because I need to do some tests of this card. This is the card from the IBM PS1 tower. And I need to do some more tests to know if I need to repair it or not. Well, I'm not sure we can get this compact much faster. But if you have any interesting ideas worth trying, let me know. It may never become a Doom machine, but it's an excellent PC for vintage DOS adventure games. I'm not sure why, but this machine is somehow very likeable. I totally get the 425 fanboys. And now is a good time to watch the video where we build the Socket Blaster, if you haven't watched it yet. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons, you guys are the best. If you want to become an early supporter of this channel too, you will find the link in the description. Thank you for watching, like, subscribe, become a patron and I'll start recording the next video.